morning Macedonia and to my Macedonia YouTube viewers and to YouTube viewers and Facebook viewers, uh, we say good morning to each and every one of you. We're so grateful, thankful to God for this opportunity we have to share in the Word of God. For truly, the Word of God uh, is certainly needed in times such as these. Uh, we're praying for you and your families, and we pray that all is well with you and that you're continuing to social distance and that you're continuing be at home as much as possible and be with your families. Uh, our prayers are yet still going out for each and every one of you. We want you to know that uh, as we continue to look to God in all things, we trust God that whatever he's doing in this season, it's going to work out for our good. So we just want to encourage you this morning and ask that you would continue to pray for one another and pray with one another. Uh, I want to say to the Macedonia church family that uh, we are yet still Macedonia strong. Uh, don't ever forget that. We are in the process of preparing to come back to worship corporately, uh, but I want you to know that we will not be in any kind of hurry uh, to come back. Uh, we want to make sure that everything that is needed uh, for us to be safe uh, and to be cautious during this time, we want to make sure that those things are in place uh, so you can be protected and be safe as you come back for worship. So I ask that you would be prayerful for us, uh, that we make the right decisions, that we put everything in place that needs to be in place, uh, that you may have a safe return as we reconvene uh, our worship. Uh, just want to kind of put into your mindset that when we finally do uh, come back, that uh, it's going to, our worship will look somewhat different. Uh, I want you to be uh, prayerful and understandable uh, as we prepare to create a safe worship environment uh, for our membership. So just be prayerful for us during this time uh, and as we uh, get closer to the time that we shall uh, come back, we will certainly keep you informed and, and let you know uh, just when that time will come. In the meantime, just be prayerful for us that we make the right decisions going forward, uh, that we may have a safe, uh, enjoyable, and spiritual worship uh, when we have the opportunity to uh, reconnect share in fellowship. Uh, we are going today to uh, a new book, uh, 2 Corinthians is where we will begin today. And um, 2 Corinthians is much different from 1 Corinthians in that uh, in 2 Corinthians, Paul is not really dealing with the doctrinal issues that he dealt with in chapter, uh, in the first book. Uh, 1 Corinthians was more of uh, debating and, and clarifying some issues concerning uh, church doctrine uh, and uh, he was able to clarify those in that letter. Uh, the second book is uh, uh, deals more with Paul's uh, personal experiences. Uh, when we begin today, uh, Paul is having issues uh, with the Corinthian church uh, about his delay when we last met, uh, Paul had spoken about uh, the fact that he would be delayed in his coming. Uh, some, some of the Corinthian believers and some of the uh, uh, church leaders had a problem with that. And uh, Paul was somewhat grieved by it and thus wanted to clarify some things. And so he writes it in this letter. Uh, one, of the, one of the hardest things that uh, any believer deals with is church hurt um, when they've been hurt by the church uh, it's it becomes so detrimental to their uh, to their lives uh, you know, they blame everybody uh, they put everybody in the same boat uh, and in most cases uh, that church hurt probably came from only one person but it, you know, everybody is is included of course Bible does teach us that we're one body and so if, if one uh, apple is bad then you know it makes it bad for the for the whole bunch and so uh, I can see it from that perspective but I do want us to understand that we can get beyond church hurt uh, many don't uh, once they've been bitten or hurt by the church uh, they leave and they never come back uh, and so uh, I want to 
just say a little something concerning that because we must understand that we are in this together. And so we have to find a way that we can be unified and work together, have an understanding, come to common ground, uh, learn forgiveness. Paul's gonna talk about that today. Uh, he's gonna apologize, but then he's gonna ask for forgiveness. And one of the things that's hard for us to do when we've been hurt is to forgive. And, but it's, the, it's essential and it's key in our walk of faith and in us being uh, who we are in Christ. Uh, Christ forgives us daily. Uh, we should be willing to forgive as well. Christ even spoke on forgiveness uh, in that Christ said that if you're not able to remit the sins of your brethren, uh, he would not be able to remit the sins, your sins, before the Father. And so we have to understand the importance of forgiving, even though we've been hurt. And that's one of the things that is very difficult for not only the believer, but even the non-believer, is um, accepting the fact that you've been hurt, uh, moving beyond that, and learning to forgive that, that individual or, or who has hurt you. Uh, and you know, we, we are strengthened when we learn how to forgive, because that is the love of Christ is that we be willing at all times to forgive because he forgives us uh, every day. And so we should be forgiving of others as well, uh, every opportunity that we have. So as we go into 1 Corinthians today, I won't hold you long. I'll only hold you as long as this chapter will allow us to. But uh, chapter 1 is going to be uh, virtually uh, Paul's introduction uh, which is similar in just about all of his epistles. Paul is a great writer. Paul is a great orator. And so uh, he's able to uh, put his words together uh, very eloquently, uh, as so many of our modern day preachers today uh, have a great dialect, uh, able to uh, speak very well, but then they're also, they are great writers as well. And so Paul is that great writer. He is that great orator. And as he begins to open up this chapter, uh, he opens uh, in humility and in love, uh, for he will talk about uh, the grace of, of God and the peace of God um, in the beginning of this chapter. So if you would, let us uh, go to verses 1 and 2 uh, and let us talk about, about those and let us move forward in this chapter. Before we do so, let us go to God in prayer. Thank you for this day, for this opportunity we have to share in the Word. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for all that you are and all that you have been in our lives. And Lord, we ask now that as we search the scriptures today, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit, O oh God, would speak to our hearts. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that you would give us a listening ear to hear what the Spirit has to say to our hearts. And it is our prayer, O oh God, that when uh, we have closed out this session of study, Lord, that we will be doers of that which we've heard take those instructions and use them in our daily lives, that the world may see you in us, and that many may come crying, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Lord, we ask now that your grace and mercy and your peace be upon your people as we study the scriptures on this day. Therefore, we give you all honor, we give you glory, we give you the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we give thanks. Amen. Chapter 1, verse 1, from the original King James Version of the Bible. You shall find inscribed these words, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul basically identifies himself as being one of the apostles, not of his own will, but by Jesus Christ uh, and by the will of God, uh, not of his own will. Uh, and he also introduces Timothy as being his brother in the gospel. Um, and he also makes address to the saints who are in Corinth and in Achaia, uh, which is a neighboring town. And also he says to them um, in a humble way, in a humble spirit, grace be unto you and peace from God our so he extends the grace of God and the peace of God as he opens up his letter. Uh, Paul always uh, greeted believers uh, with his desire that they may experience grace and peace. Um, 
one of the things that keeps us uh, daily uh, is the fact that God gives us grace and peace uh, every day. Uh, granted new mercies by God uh, every day. And so we're thankful that we serve a God that supplies us with all the grace and mercy and peace that we need to make it through each day. And therefore, we should always be grateful for the God of peace and the God of grace and mercy. Uh, let's look at verses 3 uh, through verse 11, if you will. He says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the, in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer whether we be comforted it is for your consolation and salvation and our hope of you is steadfast knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings so shall ye also be of the consolation for we would not brethren have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia but we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us yea also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift be bestowed upon us by the means of many persons thanks may be given by many on our behalf so he begins to talk about this God who is a God of all comfort uh, he speaks on the fact that uh, he is the God of all comfort uh, whether we're suffering or whether we are in troubled time or whether we are in, in good time it does not matter what the situation may be. Uh, he says that the God we serve is the God of all comfort. Therefore, he can comfort us in anything and any situation. Even as we are battling and in battle with this pandemic for our lives, God is yet still the God of all comfort. And he's yet comforting us even as we experience tragedies and the troubles that this pandemic has brought upon us. So he wants to encourage us to know that we serve a God that is always ready and able to give us comfort. But he also says we must understand that uh, as he has suffered, uh, believers must understand the importance of knowing that we have to suffer from time to time uh, there are times that we must suffer because if we uh, identify ourselves with Christ we have to also suffer with Christ the text tells us that if we want to reign with Christ we must also suffer as Christ suffered and so uh, Paul says uh, don't think it's strange when you find yourself suffering uh, you're just only being identified as being a child of the king this child of the king is able to console us and comfort us uh, in times of suffering, but he's also able to save us in times of suffering. So he wants us to uh, have our hope, our trust, our faith in this God uh, who is able to comfort. He even talks about his own personal experience uh, when he was in Asia and was almost killed for the sake of Christ, uh, he had to suffer uh, being beaten and almost put to death. Uh, he had hope in the fact that even though he had to suffer, God was yet still there to bring comfort 
and deliver him from the hand of death. And so he's, he's not afraid. Uh, he understands. Uh, the difference between Paul and many of us is that we don't understand why we have to suffer. Uh, but I just told you earlier, we must suffer if we want to reign with Christ. We must suffer as Christ suffered for us. And so suffering is only an identification that you're walking close with the Master. So uh, my suggestion to you is as you go through uh, life and experience its troubles and its trials and its sufferings, uh, glory in the fact that uh, you're only being identified with the crucified one who still lives and lives in us right today. Uh, let us look at uh, verses uh, 12. Uh, let us go to verse 12, if you will. Let us look at verses 12 through 14 uh, as Paul uh, uh, continues uh, to express, uh, pour out of himself and express his, his sincerity. Uh, in verse 12 he says, For our rejoicing is this, testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity not with fleshly wisdom but by the grace of God we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you for we write none of the things unto you than what ye read or acknowledged and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end as also ye have acknowledged us in part that we are your rejoicing even as ye are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. So Paul kind of explains his delay and he uh, lets them know that his delay uh, in Paul's delay is, it is apparent that um, uh, his sincerity was in question. They wanted to, uh, there was some question about uh, his sincerity to be with them, his sincerity to come to them. And it was in doubt at the time, but Paul wanted the Corinthian uh, church to remember that, uh, re remember who he is, his integrity, and to accept his good intentions toward them in spite of his delay. And so he wanted to let them know that uh, they should have confidence that uh, in the fact that uh, his delay did not have anything to do with him being uh, unsincere to their need, but there was a there was a need that he uh, must must be delayed. Uh, but his delay had nothing to do with them or his love for them. Let's look at verses 15 through 17. He says, "And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that ye might have a second benefit, and to pass by you in Macedonia." come again out of Macedonia unto you and you to be brought on my way toward Judea when I therefore was thus minded did I use lightness or the things that I purpose do I purpose according to the flesh that with me there should be yea yea and nay nay um, again he's continuing to defend his integrity uh, by explaining the consequence of his events that led him to change his original plans um, we all have uh, set goals and we all have plans uh, for our lives and even for for the day we could just narrow it down to when we get up in the morning we all have plans for the day things that we want to do or things that we want to get accomplished and sometimes we experience the fact that you know even though we had made plans for that day uh, things happen that causes us to make changes in our plan that should be indicative of everyone. Everyone should understand the fact that plans do change from time to time. Uh, and uh, I had planned uh, to be in Houston uh, the first week in May uh, to watch my son graduate, but uh, this pandemic uh, changed everything. And so I had to make changes because there are some circumstances that caused me to change. And so we must be understanding uh, with one another as believers that we may have good intentions uh, we may have a goal or a purpose uh, but sometimes those goals and purposes and intentions uh, there are things that happen in our lives that cause us sometimes uh, to have to change those goals or change those intentions and Paul wanted them to be understanding of that and we as believers ought to be understanding 
of one another as well. Verse 18, he says, But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen. And the glory of God by us. Now he which established us with you in Christ and have anointed us is God, who have also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Uh, so Paul is kind of is defending uh, his walk with Christ uh, or establishing the fact uh, that he uh, is a believer in Christ. Uh, in fact, uh, he's actually uh, supporting uh, his preaching. Uh, he says, we preach the same thing. Uh, we didn't preach anything controversial. Uh, everything that we preached was was positive concerning uh, our Lord and Savior and he also establishes this and you've heard this bef before uh, um, you know we only speak in it we only speak those things that are positive he says because he says in verse 20 that the promises of God in him are yea and amen and so what Paul is saying is there is uh, no doubting in God if he said it uh, you can believe it uh, whatever promise God made uh, it's a go. Uh, it can't be changed. It can't be altered. Uh, what God has preordained must come to pass. And so he wants us to also understand as we make changes along the way, we serve a God who, in the course that he's made promises, in those promises, he is a promise keeper. Uh, many of us have made promises that we were unable to keep. But at the time, we felt like we could keep those promises, but circumstances caused us to make changes, and therefore we were not able to fulfill that promise. What he says about this God that we serve, and this God that he has preached, is the fact that he's a God of promise, and he does not go back on his promise. Uh, there is a uh, Hebrew word uh, for the God of promise, which is called Yahweh. Yahweh uh, speaks of the God of the promise, which means that if he's made a promise, he does not go back on his word. Whatever he said, he has to back it up. And who wouldn't serve a God uh, who um, stands on what he says and backs up what he says? Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could be more like Christ, more like the Father in that we should let our yea be yea and our nay be nay, and we should stand on what we believe. Um, Paul says uh, the strong Christian and the mature Christian learns to stand on what he or she believes because you've got God who has your back. And so if we stand on the promises of God, we have God to back us up because God is a God of promise, and he does not go back on his, his word. Let us look at, uh, if you would, uh, verse 22. Uh, verse 21, he says, you know, Now he which established us with you in Christ and have anointed us is God. He said, All this has come by way of God, who has given us uh, his Son, uh, who gave us new life in, in God through Jesus Christ. But then also in verse 22, he says, By giving by the giving of his son, um, he has, those who believe in the son, who have given their lives uh, to the son, have now been sealed and given the earnest of, of the spirit in our hearts. Uh, to those who have been saved, to those who have accepted Christ as their savior, Paul, Paul, said, uh, Paul defends uh, uh, his salvation in saying that you know, he believed in the God of promise. He's preached this God of promise. Uh, not only that, but he believed in this God of promise that has sent his one and only begotten son. And that now he has been sealed and has been given the earnest of his spirit. So uh, he wanted them to know that he was a true child of God. And I want to share with each of you today who have accepted Christ as your Savior. Uh, there is some good news right here in the text. You know, 
but once he saved you, he sealed you. And to be sealed on, according to this plan of sealing, the only one that can unseal us is him. And we found out just earlier that he's not going to unseal us. If he sealed us, we're sealed until the day of redemption. So therefore, he's not going to go back because he's a God of promise. Uh, he's a God of yea and amen. And so that yea means yes, that amen means yes, which means that you're in agreement. And so if God uh, is in agreement with the fact that he does not go back on his word, if he sealed us, we're sealed until the day of redemption. There's nothing we can do that would cause him to unseal us before the day of redemption. So we are sealed and given the earnest of his spirit. And to be given the earnest of his spirit uh, is to be given uh, a portion of his spirit. We don't have it all. We have an earnest. Uh, it's, a, it's a down payment uh, for what is to come uh, when he redeems us. Uh, but until then, uh, we have been given the earnest of his spirit. And we should be grateful that uh, the spirit of God uh, lives on the inside of us. And no one can take that away from us. Uh, we've been sealed until the day of redemption. Verse 23, he says, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Um, Paul had argumented his earlier explanation of his changed travel plans. Uh, he took a second oath swearing that his motivations were pure, it, it had nothing to do with his dislike for them or, or him not wanting to be there. But uh, he swears uh, as God being uh, God for his record that you know his intentions were true and his intentions were honest. And so he starts off this, off this chapter trying to break the ice, uh, trying to restore fellowship and relationship with the Corinthian believers who had some doubt about who he was uh, and his intentions for coming and sharing with them in the gospel. Uh, it hurt Paul, uh, but Paul knew that it was important uh, to reestablish a connection with them. And so first of all, in chapter one, he just pours out his heart uh, to those who have doubt, uh, hoping that they would understand and know his sincerity uh, and receive, uh, receive him uh, as, as he is. So we've got a good time. Uh, we're going to move a little further. We can go on into chapter 2. Uh, if you all have time, uh, let us look at, look at chapter 2. Uh, there are some things that was in chapter 1, uh, some principles that I want to share with you uh, before we go to chapter 2. Uh, one of the things that we need to understand is that God's grace is a higher standard than the world's wisdom. And so um, God's grace overshadows everything. The world has their way. Uh, the world has its wisdom. But God's grace uh, is well above uh, the world's wisdom uh, and man's knowledge. Uh, second principle we need to know is that God's discipline is ultimately restorative. Uh, Paul believed that if he um, continued uh, in his faith walk with God, uh, continued to encourage them, through the teachings of the Word of God and stand fast on his faith in God. Uh, he believed that at some point uh, those who had issues with him um, would uh, be willing to accept him uh, and restore that relationship uh, that he longed to have with them. Uh, God uh, is a restorer. Uh, if we put it in his hands and allow him to work it out, He's able to restore us, you know, even when we have experienced church hurt. Uh, and so I want to share that with those who may uh, have experienced some church hurt, some disappointment, uh, some things you thought the church should have done, uh, some ways that you, you, you may have felt the church treated you that was unfair and was not right. Uh, I want to encourage you to let you know that God can restore that relationship if you let him. Uh, and so you've got to be willing to let God restore you and restore that relationship that has been lost between you 
and fellow believers. And then we need to understand that suffering is normal and necessary as a part of our Christian life. I said it earlier, uh, if we want to reign with Christ, we must also suffer as Christ suffered for us. And so suffering is only an indication that you're walking close with the Savior. Uh, be uh, thankful for that. Give God glory for that uh, in that you are walking closer with him simply because uh, you've had to experience some suffering uh, in, in your life. Well, we're going to go on over into chapter 2, um, knowing about this God who is the God of all comfort, uh, who's able to restore us, who's able to keep us. Uh, let us take a journey on over into chapter 2 and let us let us look at a few verses as we move forward uh, in, in the text. Uh, if you'll look at verses uh, 1 through 4 in chapter 2, let us read those as we move forward today. He says, But I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he that then maketh me glad, but the same which is made sorry by me. And I wrote this same unto you, lest ye when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Uh, Paul writes this letter uh, with a heavy heart. Uh, writes this letter, uh, wanting them to wanting them to understand um, the importance of knowing that he has come to them uh, out of a pureness of heart, and um, he even shared the fact that he was grieved by the fact that many uh, doubted uh, his intentions. He wanted them to know that his heart was heavy and basically basically he was asking um, for their forgiveness and here's the here's the key uh, if if someone has if you've wronged someone let me put it that way if you've wronged someone and that person has come to you and expressed that wrong towards you uh, you ought to be willing to ask that person accept how that person feels about the situation and you ought to be willing to forgive that individual uh, because once it is known then it's up to you to accept it and then it's also up to you to be willing to forgive um, if you're not willing to forgive I told you this earlier then don't expect Christ to forgive you uh, in in that day that you stand before before an all wise God and so we want you to know the importance when someone pours out their heart uh, be willing to ask for their forgiveness uh, Paul's going to talk here about the importance of forgiveness as we move into uh, further into this chapter in fact we're going to go there now and look at verses 5 through 11 if you will uh, chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 reads uh, in this wise he says but if any have caused grief he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So the contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps, perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him, for to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul really wanted to... Uh, get them to understand the importance of forgiveness and, and how important it is. Uh, he remembered that he had dealt uh, severely with the case of sin in the church. And if Paul really cared about the Corinthians' joy, um, 
why had he judged the sinner so harshly? Um, he judged them so harshly simply because um, they did not have a forgiving, a forgiving spirit. So he begins to explain the importance of forgiving. For he says, if um, we forgive, understand that that forgiveness goes back to the fact that we have this earnest of God's spirit on the inside. And if we do have this earnest of God's spirit on the inside, then it causes us to have that spirit of forgiveness as well. And so he wants us to know the importance of having the earnest of God's spirit because if we don't have the earnest of God's spirit, then we won't be able to fully forgive. And therefore that sin yet is remitted to the one who is unwilling to forgive. And to that one who is unwilling to forgive, they become a pawn of Satan's. And so he says, lest you know, Satan gets the credit and lest Satan, lest we become a pawn of Satan, we must understand the importance of yielding to the Spirit of God that we might be able to forgive others who have wronged us or who have had doubt in us uh, in our walk with Christ. Always be willing to forgive. That is so important. Uh, one of the reasons why church hurt uh, is, is so um, huge in the churches, in our churches today is because we never sit down to have conversation. Um, individuals won't pour their hearts out to one another. Paul is pouring his heart out uh, to the church uh, that they may understand that he is genuine, he is being real, and really he's really putting it back on them to receive it and be willing to forgive. This is basically what chapter 1 and chapter 2 is all about, he is understanding the importance that God can comfort you uh, you know, if your heart is heavy and if you've been hurt, he can bring you comfort. Uh, but as he brings you comfort, allow his spirit to teach you how to uh, forgive those who may have hurt you or wronged you. Uh, 12 and 13 says, Furthermore, when I came to you, uh, when I came to Troas to preach uh, Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence to Macedonia. So he's kind of explaining his delay. Uh, as he stopped in Troas to preach the gospel, uh, there were some doors that were open. And as those doors were open, uh, it caused Paul to have a delay to spend more time um, uh, in Troas, uh, in, in areas such as Macedonia, uh, before he came to to Corinth, so he's continuing to explain uh, the circumstances that caused his delay. Yeah. But he gives some some he gives them some encouraging words in the last few verses of this second chapter. When he when we look at verses fourteen through seventeen, he says, "Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and make it manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place." For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. Paul reflected on God's goodness in his ministry despite the disappointment that took place in uh, Troas. He says, uh, he gives thanks unto God who, uh, even though there was some circumstances that uh, caused his delay, um, he says at the end of the day, he ended up triumphing in Christ. So what looked like, um, it may, what looked like uh, trouble ended up being triumph and that's why that's the way we need to look at life as well as children of God uh, we may find ourselves in situations that may look like we're in trouble uh, but um, if we serve the God who is the God of all comfort who is able to keep us from falling who is able to open that door that no man can open uh, we must understand that uh, trouble ultimately turns into triumph as we follow 
uh, God and have that earnest of his spirit working in our lives. Uh, he wants, uh, he wanted them to understand who we are uh, in Christ and of God. We are a sweet savor unto him. Uh, he wants us to know the importance uh, of the relationship that we have with God and and how important that is when it comes to our walk with, with God. Um, we are important to him. Uh, we are a sweet savor unto him. Um, we are his. And he also breaks down the fact that uh, whether in life or death, we all belong to him. Uh, God is the supreme being. Uh, he is the creator. Uh, and if he's creator, he's in control and he's over all things. Uh, Paul wanted to establish that is that he's following an all-wise and an all-knowing God who again is able to comfort us with all comfort but is also able to restore us uh, when we've experienced hurt uh, and we've gone through times of trouble and suffering. Be encouraged my brothers and my sisters that we serve a God who is able uh, to keep us in times of trouble He's able to comfort us with all comfort. Uh, he is a God that keeps his promise. Uh, not only that, uh, he is a God um, that has forgiven us many times over. Uh, let us have a heart to forgive one another. Um, even when we have situations that's caused us to doubt one another, let us come to common ground. Uh, let us have conversation. Let us learn to hear one another out. Uh, Paul wanted them to hear him out. They had, they had already had their say. Paul wanted them to hear him out, but then ultimately he wanted them to come to common ground and be forgiving one of the other. Uh, who is it that you need to forgive? Um, whoever that individual is, learn that the only way you can truly forgive is that the Spirit of God must be working in your life because it is God who forgives and he forgives through us. Uh, be willing to forgive. Be willing to hear one another out. Be willing to come to common ground and understand that even though we may set goals in life, even though we have good intentions in life, uh, sometimes our plans ultimately change in life. But we serve a God who never changes, and thus he already has a plan for our lives. So if it happened to have caused us to make changes, God is allowing it because God knows what lies ahead. It didn't happen by accident. It was purposed. And, I'm, and we ought to be thankful that wherever God is leading us, we ought to be willing to follow and understand that he knows what lies ahead. I'm going to stop right there today. I hope something was said today that would further your walk with Christ. For truly it is about our walk with him. We've looked at the first two chapters of 1 Corinthians. And it is going to be somewhat different. Paul is giving personal encounters, uh, personal experiences. And as we go forward, uh, Paul's going to talk about his sufferings and the things that he's had to go through. He's also going to talk about some things that he has had the opportunity to see. That, that no other man has seen and thus he's not willing to talk much about it uh, but he did want to uh, give some uh, some viewpoints of it and so uh, this second Corinthians is going to be more of a personal uh, experience of our brother Paul uh, and much different from from the first book uh, there won't be much doctrine teaching here you will see a lot of personal experiences and teachings on his behalf uh, that he may restore and continue fellowship and relationship uh, with the believers there in Corinth and, and other parts of Asia Minor. We hope something again that we've gone through today uh, will be a blessing to your lives. Uh, continue to pray for one another, continue to lift one another, uh, continue to be encouraged that God is yet still working a work and whatever he's doing in this season, ultimately he's going to work it out for our good. Go with me now in a word of prayer as we close out this session of teaching. Bow your heads, if you will. God, our Father, we thank you for this day again. We thank you for this time we've had to share in the word of God. Thank you for teaching us that you are the God of all comfort. I thank you for teaching us, oh God, that you are the God of the promise. And not only that, but if you're the God of the promise, you are a God that does not go back on your promise, but you fulfill your promise. Uh, you are a God of yes and amen. And you're in agree we're in agreement with that, Lord, so we trust you in all things knowing that whatever you're doing in this season, you're working it out for our good. Bless us in our going out and our coming in. Bless our families. Bless our homes. Cover us and keep us by your blood from this COVID pandemic. 
Lord, I pray, oh God, that you will bless every family under the sound of my weak voice. Lord, that you will keep them in your care. Watch over them as only you can. And we shall forever look to the hills for which cometh our help, realizing all of our help comes from thee and thee alone. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do, even for what you're doing right now. God, we give you the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake we do pray. Amen. God bless you. May heaven smile on you. Is always.